Howdy and welcome back to another Bevy video. Today we're doing something new again. I spent the past few weeks doing a deep dive into Bevy rendering and trying to learn some VFX programming. In this process, I learned a lot about the lower levels of Bevy's rendering, and I realized a lot of it is undocumented and difficult for people to understand. So for this video, I'm hoping to explain some of how rendering works, and we're going to look at solely an example from within the engine. Specifically, we're going to look at how UI is rendered because that's one of the simplest subsystems in the engine that shows off all of the cool rendering features people want to learn. This video is currently targeting Bevy 0.11's master branch, but looking at the Git history and the milestone PRs shows that none of this has changed significantly so far in the Bevy 11 pre-release, so I'm hopeful this will stay relevant for a long time. Also, this has nothing to do with how Bevy does UI layout, and we'll be starting from the UI nodes as rectangles on the screen and getting to the actual GPU draw calls. So first up, I want to give a high-level overview of how rendering in Bevy works. The final goal of all rendering systems in Bevy is to issue calls into WGPU. WGPU is the underlying dependency Bevy uses for rendering, and I would recommend skimming the Learn WGPU book at some point, because it's such a core part of the Rust game dev ecosystem. In this video, we're going to see how Bevy abstracts over the first five-ish chapters of Learn WGPU, covering everything from pipelines and bind groups down to the final draw calls to draw our triangles. If we look at the source code for the Learn WGPU Tutorial 5, we'll see it's almost exactly what we'll cover in Bevy. First, they create some core resources like the device and queue, which we'll see as Bevy resources, then they create some bind groups and shaders, which will control the data and code on the graphics card. Bindings for our purposes are just going to be the data on the graphics card in its location. Next, they create a render pipeline, which gives a specification of how this specific pipeline will work with and handle primitives. Then they create some vertex and index buffers that will decide how and where triangles will appear on the screen. Finally, when it's time to render, they create a render pass and issued the draw calls to use the pipelines, buffers, and draw the actual triangles. Now for the overview for the Bevy structure of the exact same flow. I'm going to break this out into five main steps. First, we have Extract, where all of the data needed to render the game is taken out of our game simulation world and is copied into a render sub-app. This allows for the simulation to continue to the next frame, while the rendering app works in isolation to draw the previous state. Then, we have the prepare stage, where we'll set up all of the vertex data and write the vertex buffer. Next is the queue stage, which is often very overwhelming for people when they first see queue functions. The goal here is to get the pipeline created, set up the bind groups, and finally add every entity we want to draw into something called a render phase. In practice, render phases are just a list of items that we're going to use to perform our draw calls. The only one we'll look at today is called Transparent UI. At this point, the main ECS systems and stages stop being where the control flow goes, and I think this is part of what confuses people in learning these systems. After this, step 4 is actually taking place in the render graph. Roughly speaking, the render graph is an acyclic graph that lets you control the order of when certain parts of the game will render and pass data between the rendering steps. The actual place where our code for rendering happens is in the UI pass nodes run function, which will be called by the render graph. Here's where we pick up the trail once again and get our hands on the entities queued in the render phase. We then perform the final bit of the WGPU chain and start the render pass and call render on the render phase. This takes us to the fifth and final step where for each item we queued up, the render commands are called. Render commands use a little bit of Rust magic, but basically here's where Bevy is abstracted over the last bits of the WGPU example of setting up the pipeline and the bind groups and issuing the actual draw commands. Obviously, this is a lot of information to absorb, and this is a pretty complex control flow, so don't worry if it doesn't click yet. For the rest of this video, we'll go into depth on each one of these steps and the magic behind them before doing a final recap and covering the big picture once again. Alright, so without further ado, let's go back to step 1, which should be the easiest to follow, Extract. The goal here is to copy all of the data we need from the main app, and then we can allow both rendering and simulation to continue without worrying about each other. 
This is a sync point between rendering and simulation processes, so both must wait for extract to finish before they can proceed. For this reason, Bevy highly recommends just doing quick copies and not performing any algorithms in this stage. From the App Builder, we can see we're adding two main systems, one to extract the camera view and one to extract the UI nodes. Again, to future-proof this video, I'm looking at the master branch of Bevy, which uses a new syntax for setting up the system schedules, but the same idea is true in the Bevy 0.10 old syntax. So in general, extract systems are pretty simple, and there's also macros to derive extract for simple components and resources. Here, for each camera, if it is set to render UI, we'll get a basic projection matrix based on the logical size and the viewport based on its physical size. I can't say I'm super clear on the differences here, but the main idea is that this will be processed down to the camera matrix we multiply by in the final shader. We also create another entity, which contains a wrapper over the one we just created, and we'll see this again in the render node, and this creates the actual render phase that we'll be adding items to in the queue step. I can't say why this entity indirection happens here, but we'll see more of this in the node run step. The important things we get from here are the extracted view component and the render phase component. Now for extracting the actual UI nodes we want to draw. I didn't mention it before, but the extract wrapper of the query tells us that we're getting data from the main app world. So the only persistent render world data we're using here is the extracted UI nodes resource. It's a little unclear why they use this resource instead of spawning the nodes as entities, but my best guess is that we do a sort again in the next step, and this is just a performance optimization. In this system, we just use the UI stack, which is maintained elsewhere, to have an ordering of the UI nodes. Then, we get entities according to that ordering. We skip invisible nodes, and we'll copy the image handles if they exist, and then finally, we'll push all the data we need into the extracted UI nodes resource, and we are done with the extract step. Now we have our rectangle and image that we'll use to render in the render app. I'm going to step out of tutorial mode and ask an open question. I see this looping over the entities by the order in the UI stack, and this technique of getting entities from the query makes my performance brain itch, especially in extract. For large entity counts, I think it would be more cache friendly to get the entities in the order they come from the query iteration. Also, looking ahead the next step, we immediately call sort by the same stack index, which seems to make adding things to the vector in a certain order pointless. Obviously, you'd want to measure this, because calling sort on an ordered vect might be basically free, and there are also the UI text functions I'm not looking at for this video, but this just makes my brain itch in a weird way. Well, after that aside, we might as well start looking at the actual prepare stage. In the UI rendering module, only the prepare UI node system is in the prepare stage, but we also need to follow what's happening to our extracted view. For the UI nodes we just extracted, our main goal is to write the vertex data to a UI meta resource, which holds the vertex buffer in the bind group for the view. For now, we're only going to care about the vertices though. This function is a little bit overwhelming, but there's really nothing happening here. Here, UI draw calls are batched if they have the same image, which is a nice optimization, but it adds a little bit of noise for us. For each node, we're going to first get the rectangle that defines where it should be on screen, then we'll turn that into the basic coordinates of the four corners of a quad. There's a little bit of math here because UI nodes support clipping, and this can change the corner positions. Then we create the UV values to decide which parts of the image to use. Here, the atlas values are only used for text rendering, and Bevy UI still doesn't support texture atlases, even though that would be a wonderful feature, and the rendering infrastructure is already here. Just in extract, it's hard set to none for basic UI nodes. Some flipping logic is handled, and the clipping is applied again, but overall this is just boilerplate UV work. Finally, we'll push all of the vertex and UV data into the vertices buffer and update the end value. Now, back at the start of the loop, we can understand that the UI batch component is spawned on entities whenever a new image shows up, and the range here tracks which vertices are associated with this image.
This allows for the same image binding to be drawn multiple times in a single call when we finally get to the draw functions in step 5. The other prepare function we need to look at handles the view we extracted from the camera and is located in the main rendering module. This is much simpler and just uses the extracted view to create a view uniform that will bind and use in the shader. All we use for UI is the projection matrix, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but this is used for all rendering systems. The things you see about offsets are because I think they're writing all of the views in the game to a single buffer, and then when we bind we'll use the offset for our specific view. So that was a lot of code, but it was pretty simple to follow. So now we're ready for step 3, Q, which will be less code, but it will be a little bit more difficult to follow. You know you're in for a fun time when you see Clippy allow too many arguments. Before we can tackle the Q system, we need to take a detour into some of the resources the system gets. First, let's look at the UI pipeline. Remember at the beginning of the WGPU example that the pipeline is just a giant descriptor for how the GPU will handle our data. The pipeline here has a from world implementation that it uses to set up the bind group layouts for the view and the images we'll use. I don't want to go too deep into this for this video, but the important idea is that this tells the GPU to expect our view data and image descriptor data and where it will be. The other half of the pipeline is described by this specialized render pipeline trait impl. Here we can use a key which only says if the HDR is active or not to create a pipeline descriptor. Again, I recommend reading Learn WGPU if you want to deep dive into this, but basically first this tells the GPU how we laid out the vertex data back in prepare. Then it sets our UI vertex and fragment shader, which now is as good a time as any to look at. In the shader, nothing interesting happens. We multiply by the projection matrix to get the position, and for our fragment shader, we just sample the image and multiply by the color. All of the interesting work today is happening in getting the data to this point. Back in the pipeline descriptor, we also use the layouts we described earlier to put the view in position 0 and the image into position 1, and we say our topology is just a standard triangle list. Nothing too exotic here, but it's a lot of detail-oriented work that Learn WGPU, and honestly any Vulkan tutorial will explain in great detail. Biffy has some caching mechanisms that I won't go into detail on, but basically, once we create the pipeline on the GPU, Bevue will get the same pipeline back as long as the key matches, which handles all of the issues of waiting for the GPU to create the pipeline and tracking it for us. The next thing we need to talk about before we can finally look at the queue system is draw functions. The implementation of draw functions is a little bit exotic, but the idea is pretty clear. In the original WGPU example, we saw the final sequence of functions that binds the pipelines and bind groups and finally calls the draw commands. Draw functions are Bevy's abstraction over that flow. This resource is added in the app builder and we'll look at the UI specific commands in step 5. Specifically, here we first add the draw functions container for the transparent UI render phase, and then we add the draw UI draw functions as something we can perform on the transparent UI phase items. The add render command call here is something that we'll discuss in step 5, but for queue purposes, this just allows us to get an ID number that we'll use later. Finally, let's just peek at the transparent UI strut. Here, we see that it holds something to sort by, the entity that is the actual UI batch to draw, the pipeline ID, and the draw function ID. We also have implementations for phase item and cache render pipeline phase item, which allows us to get all of these elements when we need them. Now we can finally get back to the actual queue function. First up, we have some event handling to check if an image has changed under us. This isn't too important for our reading. Next, we get the view binding, and this was created in the view prepare system we looked at, and the binding resource was created when we called write buffer after processing the extracted views. Remember that bindings for us are the locations and the data on the actual GPU, and for this binding, all we care about is the projection matrix. We see that we're creating a view bind group and adding it to the UI meta resource where we put the vertex buffer earlier. We also see we're getting the layout from the pipeline resource that we just created. Then we get the UI draw functions ID. Again, draw functions are a little bit abstract and we'll cover them again later, 
but this lets us get the ID for the draw functions that we set up in the app builder. Now for every view we extracted, we added the render phase component back in step one. For each one of those, we're going to get or create the pipeline through the specialized function we looked at earlier. Again, this uses the caching mechanism to give us the same pipeline back if the key matches. Then, for each UI batch we created and prepare, we're going to set up the image bind group using the correct image. Again, this is through another caching system, so if we did this work in an earlier frame, the bind group already exists. We'll use these bind groups and the UI meta resource in step 5 for the render commands. Finally, we can add this UI batch entity into the transparent phase for the view. Here, we give it the entity with our batch, the pipeline ID, and the draw function. We also give it a Z value to sort by, but I'm not going to worry too much about that for this video. We've done a lot of setup, so now it's time to actually look at rendering these images. As a midway recap, we first extracted our data from the main world, then we set up our views and image vertices in the prepare stage. And then we used the queue stage to add all of our UI batches to the transparent UI render phase for each view. Now we need to use that render phase to actually start drawing things onto the screen. For step four, we're going to create a render node and add it to Bevy's render graph. First, let's look at adding our node to the render graph. Here is some duplicated code for handling 2D and 3D, so we're only going to look at the 2D variants. First, we call a get UI graph helper function. This again is in the master branch of Bevy, and for Bevy 0.10 this was a little bit more complex, but I think this is due to a change in how the view entity is passed around, but the core ideas are the same. Here, we create a UI pass node that we'll look at soon, but this will be our graph node that handles our rendering. Then, we create an empty graph. Finally, we'll add the UI node to that graph. Unfortunately, there's a lot of magic strings used in the render graph, and I'm not exactly sure why. Now back in our app building function, we get the main render graph and get the subgraph for the core pipeline. Here, we add our newly created graph that has our render node. Then we add another node that runs our subgraph. Names are being reused here, so it's a bit tricky to follow, but the render graph visualization helps understand what's going on. Here you can see our subgraph and the node in the main graph that contains it. We also add edges so that the main pass and the post processing must finish before our node, and our node must finish before upscaling. The main thing to take away from this is the ordering and the nuances aren't that important for us right now. Now that our node is in the render graph, the graph runner will run it every frame once its dependency is complete. The node itself is implemented in the render pass file. Here you see we have a couple of query states, which are an internal part of Bevy's queries that allows us to manually update them and get data from the render world. In the actual implementation of the node, we first update the archetypes of the query states. This must be done with mutable access to the world and just make sure that the queries can be used correctly in the run step. Again, I'll cover archetypes and the internals of Bevy's ECS in a future video one day. Now, the meat of our rendering happens in the run function. Here, we get the view entity from the render graph. This tells us which view the graph is currently working on, and is basically an input to every node in the render graph now. We then see if this view has our transparent phase and a view target. If it doesn't, we'll just return because we aren't rendering UI for this view. We'll also return if there's not UI nodes to render, or if the UI config says not to render UI for this view. Next, we get the view entity. We created this all the way back in the extract camera stage. I'm a little unclear as to why we'd hit the fallback case here, but I'm sure this was designed for a more complex situation in user code. Either way, this should be the entity associated with the extracted view. Finally, we're making a WGPU call and calling begin tracked render pass. This is the beginning of the actual draw logic that we saw all the way back in the WGPU example. Bevy's tracked render pass is just a thin wrapper over WGPU's render pass that adds some tracing and debugging info for us. Also, the render context that the node run function provides handles all of the encoder logic for us, so we just add our commands and Bevy does the rest. The final thing we do for our render node is call render on the transparent UI phase. 
Now we're in the final step, the draw functions. A render pass has begun, and we're rendering our phase items. If we look at the render function we called in the node, we see some playing with a read-write lock, and then for every item we added to the render phase, we're going to call draw on our draw functions. If we follow draw, we find it's just a trait, but the docs point us toward render commands. If we scroll down in this draw.rs file in the rendering crate, we find that draw is implemented for any phase item and render command pair. Here, we see the draw function getting some arbitrary world data, view specific data, and phase item entity specific data, and calling render on the render commands with the data. If we scroll down just a little bit more, we see the add render command that we called back in our app builder being defined. Remember in the app builder, we added a render command called draw UI for the render phase, and this is where that app builder function was defined. So finally, let's look at draw UI. Draw UI is at the bottom of the render pass file in the UI render module. It's a bit weird to see at first because it's just a type that is a tuple of four render commands, but there's some Rust macro magic where Bevy allows a tuple of render commands to be treated as a single render command, and each of these four will be called in order. The first one is set item pipeline, which is defined in render and is why our transparent phase needed to implement cached render pipeline phase item. And all this does is use the pipeline ID to set the pipeline, just like the first call in the learn WGPU example. If we look at the strut implementing render commands, we see the three associated types we used a minute ago. These use the view entity and UI batch entity to allow us to perform queries for components and the data associated with them. Here it's being used to get the pipeline cache from the world. The next command is the set UI view bind group command which uses a constant generic to pick which slot to use. This must match everywhere else we've put the view bind group, and this is my biggest complaint with this API currently. If I wanted to swap the bind group locations, I'd need to change it in three distinct locations, and the errors would not be kind to me along the way. This command gets the view bind group from the UI meta resource we set up, and queries for the uniform offset we saw back in prepare. Our next command sets the texture bind group in a similar way, this time getting the UI bind groups we set up in queue and getting our UI batch component to decide which image to use. Again, the basic WGPU call matches the call we make here. Our final render command is the draw UI node command, which uses the vertex data from UI meta and the UI batch to decide which vertices to draw for this item. Once again, this matches the learn WGPU example. So climbing back up the tree, we have these four render commands, which are called by the draw implementation, which turned our entities into the data we requested. And then this draw function is called for each item from the render function, which we called on the phase back in our node implementation. That was a lot of code and complexity to get through, but I hope it was worth it. It took me a long time to get to the point I'm at, and I still feel like I only have a loose grasp on rendering in Bevy. For example, when I look at the UI example in render doc, I see there's only one draw command, and I can't figure out where all of our bind group and pipeline setups happen. So I don't know if there's more optimizations happening in WGPU and Bevy, or if I just don't know how things are supposed to appear in render doc. Either way, graphics programming is a massive rabbit hole, and it's been a lot of fun to learn. Before we go, let's do one more high-level overview of the rendering systems we covered today. First up, we have the UI nodes handled by the main simulation world. Then, we extract the camera in the UI nodes into the render world by copying the data. Next, we prepare the UI nodes by turning them into batches and setting all of the vertex and UV data. We also prepare the camera into its uniform data. Then, we queue up the UI batch for every view. We turn the UI batch into a phase item, and we add it to the transparent UI render phase. After that, the render graph takes over, and we use our UI node run function to start a render pass and call render on the transparent UI phase. Finally, that render call runs our draw functions, and the work is submitted to the GPU, where Bevy handles the rest and our image appears on screen. It all sounds so simple now, but we all understand how brutal it was to get to this point.
that's pretty much all I think I can fit into this video. I skimmed over a couple of the gory details, but I'm hoping this covers all of the concepts you need to get started really digging into rendering in Bevy. And I hope this can help some people get a grasp on what's going on when you first see a queue system or render commands. As always, thank you so much to my wonderful Patreons and YouTube members. I really enjoy making these deep dive videos, and I hope they can help people. I've also started working on my next intro series, and I'll drop that when the next version of Bevy is out, so please remember to subscribe if you don't want to miss it. As always, thank you so much for watching.